First, I want to say welcome all to the 27th episode of STEM Girls Talk Show, and I welcome Professor Mama and Sua Mensa. Thank you so much for your participation. We are very happy to have you here. We are here due to the efforts of the African Girls Empowerment Network. And now I will proceed to read a brief introduction where I will explain the reason why this talk show is taking place and what is the project of STEM Girls by AT Network. Women, as we know, are no less than any in any field. Over time, we have seen several examples of women excelling in various STEM fields and serving the society for the larger cow. We at the STEM Girls Initiative aims to groom girls with the same kind of inspiration and feel at home to excel in the STEM field and do their best. This talk show is a platform for the women in STEM to talk to other girls aspiring to excel in it. We are sure that after hearing from our guests, sorry, all the audience will be inspired to reach the stars. During this talk show, we will be conversing with a woman in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A woman who has made her mark and now graciously taking the time to tell us about her journey and share with us her wisdom. So. Our guest today is Professor Rosema Maman Sua Mensa. Thank you so much, Professor, for your participation. We are very really happy and glad to have you here. Professor Rosema Mama and Sua Mensa holds a BSc in Zoology, Diploma in Education, MSc, MSc Aquatic Biology from the University of Cape Coast and a PhD in Fishery Science from University of Ghana. She also holds a certificate in Aquatic Resource Management from the University of Hull, UK, as well as a postgraduate certificate in Business Administration from GIMPA. Um, she is an aquatic ecologist and has done extensive research nationally and internationally and attained the position of Chief Research Scientist and Deputy Director General at the S at the C Sir, Ghana from 2008 to 2019. Her maintained research focused on lagoons and freshwater bodies in Ghana and other countries in the West Africa subregion, as well as science policy in traditional management of aquatic resources, looking in the scientific basis, women and sanitation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, doc, uh, professor, for being here, we are very happy. So, very much having uh, me. <laughs> please, I will request all of you to keep your microphones mute, and if there is any question, please put it in the chat. Hello. But, but I Hi. <laughs> Hi, students. How are you doing? Bye. Bye. Wow, that's nice to have you all join this show. You're welcome. We right. love you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's else. listen. Yeah, yeah, we just listen. Let's hear from our professor. <laughs> okay. Listen, all, right. Your professor? all right, all right. You 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 what all could just have? unmute your mic for now when you have questions. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Unmute your mic when you have questions. Then you 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 mute it and then ask your questions. Am I correct? Yes. All right. All right. And now, madam, it is time to start. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Perfect. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for having me. And it's a pleasure mm -hmm. to interact with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am an aquatic biologist and a fishery scientist. Can you see the screen? Can the girls see? Yes, they can. They can. OK. Aquatic biology is like marine biology. You study ecology and behavior of plants and animals and microbes. Um, it's not focusing on salt water, which is marine water. Aquatic biology. You study inland lakes, ponds, rivers, waterfalls, and then you cover all aspects of life in freshwater, from algae to the fish to the plankton. 
you 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 will um, take a lot of science classes, including biology, chemistry, physics. You will learn a bit of geology and hydrology, aquatic ecosystems, botany, mycology. You will learn lab me laboratory methods and how to collect water and measure the abundance of aquatic ex organisms in water. And most of the time, aquatic biologists pursue ecology-oriented courses. You know, they conduct biological surveys, write environmental impact assessments, and then they take quality control. Why do I like my, what does it mean to be a woman in STEM and in my field? Um, I love my work. I loved going to the field. Right now, I'm retired. But um, uh, I know that there are more women needed in the field I'm in. So over the years, I have mentored a lot of young boys and girls. And that it means a lot to me to be a trailblazer and a mentor. When I was at university, I was one of the few girls who did zoology and aquatic biology uh, for my master's. And then later on, in, in, uh, for my PhD level, I, I was one of the few women who, who did fishery science for my, for my PhD. So... I've always felt that women could do it. If you set your mind to do something, you can do it. And some of the field work we've done, we've um, worked on waterfalls, we've worked on lagoons. And what you'll see one thing peculiar about all the pictures that I'll show you. But I've really enjoyed my work. Uh, and this was in Benin, uh, in West Africa. I went to work with a colleague on the Nokoi Lagoon. And also in studying waterfalls you realize in most of the pictures, you find that I'm the only woman. So I'm really encouraging young girls to go and be aquatic biologists. I, I just love my work. You need to love it and appreciate it. And so the first picture is on waterfalls. And this is one of the waterfalls in Ghana, the Fuller waterfalls. And we were looking for a waterfalls and we walked in a forest reserve. I'm showing this picture for you to know that it's hard work being a scientist and an aquatic biologist, not just the water you work in, we were going to look for a waterfall. So we had worked for about four hours in the, in the forest reserve and we we're very tired at that time. There's a lot of illegal mining going on in Ghana. So it's affecting our water bodies. It's affecting our forest reserves. So this is a team of scientists I was working with. They, I come from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. That is where I retired as Deputy Director General. And these scientists, some of them are water quality scientists, some of them are soil scientists, some of them are forestry managers and ecologists. So that is some of the work that I do. So this is the effect of um, illegal mining on, on our water bodies and on our forests in Ghana. And we, we were looking at the impacts and, and some, this is some of the work that you do when you are an aquatic ecologist or an aquatic biologist. I want to tell you that at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, there were a lot of female scientists. These women that you see, some of them are engineers, some of them are microbiologists, some of them are biotechnologists, some of them are mathematicians, some of them are physicists. I'm showing you this picture to encourage you that you can be going to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and that there's a lot of avenue for women and young girls to go into. Uh, you asked me that um, usually in STEM fields, there are more male students than female. Yes, unfortunately, women have been forging careers in my sector for years, I mean, uh, but there have been some women in other sectors too. Um, I'm sure you remember Marie Curie, there's also a lady also called Rosalind Franklin. And this is the woman who helped to find out what the double helix was in the DNA that we know today. But she's hardly recognized for that because um, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Peace Prize and at that time she was dead. And there's Evelyn Pielu. If you ever hear of Pielu, when you are working, you will think that it's a, it's a man, but it's a woman. And many of them have been lonely groundbreakers in their careers dominated by men but they have helped to open the door for us. And they often mentioned other female scientists, just as I was also mentored. But a lot, of, a lot of things have changed. And many more women are going into my field of aquatic science and fishery science, but we are really underrepresented. And in Ghana, one of my mentors, she's 96 years old now, but she was a, a, a passionate aquatic biologist. 
This is a picture of some of the pioneer scientists in Ghana. Uh, the lady over here, she is Dr. Leticia Bing. She's, she's over 90 years old. This is Professor Isabella Kwachi. She's a virologist and um, she's uh, one of the people who can make vaccines. Here I am, and this is Professor Abanda. She's a physicist. So I wanted to let you know that the pioneer female scientists also mentor the younger scientists. So why do you think there are fewer men, women in uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Well, gender discrimination, for example, compared to men, women are thought of as they are less intelligent and they are less competent in mathematics and science. And that is not true. It is not true at all. I went to an all girls secondary school and for a long time we topped the um, O levels and A levels. Where, uh, and so I'm letting you know as young girls that you can do science. It is not true that girls cannot do science or mathematics. They feel that as a woman, gender der derogation, they think that women how dare you come and be part of us men who want to do science, but you can do it. And sometimes you face some sexual harassment, you know, when you are in a company or in a field where there are a lot of men. And sometimes they can be very rude to you, and that is the incivility. Um, having said that, there are also a lot of men who encourage women, who want to see that women grow. And um, the, normally when you think of a scientist, you think of a scientist as somebody who is objective, who is rational and single-minded. Uh, 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 but you, you think that women cannot be objective, we, they see us as emotional, uh, and we can't be single-minded. But that is not true. There are women who are very, very good scientists, and women can be. So um, when women go into uh, science, STEM fields, they experience a lot of pressure, and they have to work twice as hard as men. And, and, and so I want to encourage you that you can do it. And when you get into it, just work hard. And, and, and you may be isolated, but don't worry. I mean, it's all part of the game. Once you know that other women have experienced it, you can also do it and do not be afraid. You know, generally girls, you face, we faced a lot of challenges when we are young. Uh, if we leave school early, we, they, we are married early, we get pregnant early, some of young girls die. We are prone to sexual diseases. We don't have any skills. Some of us undergo female genital mutilation. We undergo domestic violence. And some of us are trafficked. But if we remain in school, we will marry later. We'll have fewer and healthier children. We can earn an income and we'll be able to invest in our family and community. And you ask what type of things you think we should do in the community to protect, promote STEM in general. I think that we should enhance the access of girls to quality education. Please, please, can you hear me? Please, can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Ma yes, ma, yes, yeah. ma. Oh, okay. I thought I was talking to myself. <laughs> no, 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 no. I enjoyed the talk. It's quite interesting. I, I think that we should give girls quality education and to make sure that the environment they're studying is safe. Sure make opportunities and incentive for girls and their family. We should empower girls with information. So I'm really happy with what is happening, what you are doing. I mean, STEM girls, I mean. <laughs> thank I you so much, Maria. Yes. You are yeah, married. Thank you. And every girl has to learn some skills and service and support. And we should educate the community, you know, communities that girls are also important. They should go to school. They should stay in school. They should not be subject to female genital mutilation. And they should be encouraged. Yeah. You know, of course, of course. Strengthen policy and the legal frameworks in our countries. And sure. we need to demystify science to the girls. You know, science isn't something that is abstract or can't be done. It can't be done. And, and as you are doing, providing role models, this is very, very important. And then you said, when I was a student, did I ever feel peer pressure? And if so, what advice can I give? Uh, peer pressure can be two things. It can be negative peer pressure and positive peer pressure. I, I went to an all girls secondary school. So there was a lot of positive peer pressure. We all were very ambitious little criminals and we competed amongst ourselves. And mm. we all, everybody wanted to be first or amongst the first, you know? Mm -hmm. So peer pressure can be good. If it pushes you out of your comfort zone and gives you an opportunity to discover new things. 
but sometimes it can be negative. And when you 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 succumb to negative peer pressure, sometimes you feel that you've betrayed your own beliefs uh, in mm. order to conform to what others want. At university, there were very few girls in my class, and the boys were very nice at that time. The problem started when I I started began when I started working. When I started working, especially when I went to do my PhD, I was married and I had three children at that time. Some men were already doing their PhDs at that time. And um, when I finished, uh, I did it part, part time, and you, you should finish in five years, but I finished in four years. So when I finished, they were quite upset with me, and I didn't understand why. So one of my colleagues said that they didn't think that I could finish the PhD, especially when I was married and I had three children, and um, they were hoping that I would stop halfway. And there were men who were still at it before I started and they hadn't finished, you know. So these things happen even amongst your colleagues, you know. But sometimes when you are young, following your friends can be very powerful. Following them to drink, following them to smoke, following them to have a lot of sexual activity are all things that you can engage in because you want to be part of the group. So you need to be very, very careful. You know, so I want to give you a bit of advice. When you are studying science, technology, engineering, mathematics subjects, you, 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 you have to have friends. It's good to have friends, but you need to be focused and have a timetable and study. You should look for people with whom you can share interests, like exercise, music, or student leadership. Anything that you have more in common than drinking and smoking. You need to choose your friends carefully. A true friend won't push you to do something that makes you uncomfortable. And when it comes to resisting negative pressures, it's good to have a true friend, a good friend. Agree that you have each other's backs. And I mean, make sure that this is a good friend. When you are doing something which is bad, can tell you to stop, you know. And you don't always have to be part of the group. It's okay to be alone. Sometimes we give in to peer pressure to avoid feeling lonely. But spending time with yourself is a way to reinforce and think of what you, your priorities, what is important to me. And so peer pressure is real. It can be negative or positive, but you can choose which way you want to go, you know, and make sure you get yourself a counselor or a mentor you can open up to. And if your instincts are saying, this is not right for me, try to find the courage to get out. You have to learn how to be assertive. You have to learn how to say no, but not in an aggressive way. You have to know who you are and what you want. And many young women lack their self-confidence. They find it difficult to believe that they, they, they can do science and technology, engineering, mathematics, you know. But I mean, and even go to the top or even be a professor. But you can do it, you know. So and I think that mentoring and support can be very helpful. So thank you once again, STEM girls. You know? And sometimes when you have a good mentor, they can use their networks to help you look for a job or a good place at the university. You said, how can you encourage girls to be more interested and be at the forefront of STEM? And why they should follow a career in STEM? I said that, look, we should forget about the fact that girls can't do science and technology and engineering and mathematics. Girls can do it. So you need to have confidence, you know. You have to surround yourself with positive people who also will encourage you and you'll encourage them. You need to be creative and you collaborate with other people. And uh, I don't know, but you can combine technology with things that, that you like. You can combine technology with maybe having um, science cartoons for children as a project. Whatever it is, know that um, the sky is the limit, you know. You can follow your dream. And I think that you should um, think about critical thinking. That is asking yourself, why is this so? What can come out of it? I mean, critical thinking is something that... Uh, it, it should be part and part of you when you want to do science, technology, and mathematics. You shouldn't just listen to the gossip or accept anything that you are told. Ask yourself questions. Why did this happen? What they are saying, is it true? What, I mean, all these things, ask yourself. And, and join other STEM groups as you've done now. And then in other places, we should make sure that we have policies where if girls are abused, we know exactly what will happen to the abusers, okay? And why should you do STEM? There are plenty of employment opportunities. STEM professionals enjoy a pay 
advantage compared to non-STEM professionals. I mean, usually that is the way it should be. You learn variable skills, life skills that, I mean, you can be, you can use in other things, you know, and you, you learn to conceptualize, think about things, you learn to analyze, you learn to synthesize and interpret and infer. That is what I was telling you about critical thinking. So it's very important to um, do, be able to do STEM so that you sharpen your skills in this. And you can use your creativity to change the world. Just because you are doing science and technology and mathematics and change doesn't mean that you should not be a creative. That is why you should be even be more creative, you know. So it's important that you 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 think about this when you are doing robotics. Uh, in Ghana, a girls' school has won the World Robotics Award twice, you know, engineering, medicine, and computer technology. And it also helps you to secure your your future when you do STEM subjects. And you asked if there were any scholarship opportunities. And I have this on the screen. There are lots of scholarship opportunities. I just Googled list of STEM scholarships for women in African development countries. And a whole lot of this came up. So <clears throat> there are lots of STEM scholarships for young African girls to um, pursue. So um, I, I will send the list to your organizers so that they can share it with you. And so you asked that what interesting projects today have I worked with? I worked on so many projects, but you wanted to know those on malnutrition, HIV, or other diseases. I haven't worked on HIV, but um, I have looked at community water and sanitation and how women are fairly pleased when it comes to water and sanitation. Girls are the ones who normally fetch water, and where the standpipe is, where the well is, that all that kind of thing. I have looked at that. I have looked at traditional fishery management practices in um, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Nigeria, and Ghana. And um, one of the things that stood out in all these countries was that women in their menstrual period were not allowed to cross lagoons. And that came out in all these countries. And I thought that was very interesting. And I also realized that women were normally the fish processors and, and, and all that. You know? And when I asked, we, I helped to assess Ghana's natural assets. And I, I saw that role that women played in uh, conservation of biodiversity. Uh, and I worked on, as I said, lagoons. I've done so much work, and, but I wanted to take out just a few that would answer some of your questions. No. You said that in this COVID age, what do you think are the biggest risks that women and girls face? And um, I think that um, um, women, because of the lockdown, were especially um, prone to gender-based violence and also exploitation, child labor. And um, this lockdown, there were lots of diseases because women can tend to care for older people and ill people, and they were very, very vulnerable. And so I, I think that um, it's very important that um, young girls are, are really protected um, during this age. They should understand what the whole thing is about and, and do the basic things of washing their hands, wearing masks, and um, also, especially when they are in their menstrual period, authorities, school authorities should um, give them safe places to change, be able to have water to ch wash their hands and wash themselves. And, and, and every time there's any disease outbreak, women and children are the most uh, vulnerable. And uh, when the quarantine measures are put in, there should be support for uh, women and girls who face um, domestic violence because there was an upset of domestic violence during the uh, COVID-19. And uh, what can we do about it? Um, as I've told you, um, we should be sensitive to this problem, to young women and girls, and try and help them. But the other positive aspect is that a lot of women were involved in um, acquiring, advancing knowledge on the virus. They were involved in development of vaccines for the virus. And these are things that people hardly talk about. But a lot of women went in getting a solution um, for the corona, um, for the COVID-19 and the coronavirus. That's a positive aspect. And you said that women often are exposed to stereotypes and discrimination. And do I think that having more women studying in STEM will really be beneficial? Yes, yes, yes. You see, the discrimination has to stop at some point. 
And we are the only people who can do it. With more girls in STEM and more role models, the whole idea of women not capable of STEM will fade away and prove everybody wrong. There's a perception that girls are not good girls. We need to prove them wrong. You know? And we have to empower girls, as I said, with the can-do spirit and not the cannot-do spirit. So all of you listening to me, you can do science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It is not difficult. You just have to it and you can conquer it. We need to provide girls with education. All of you should have confidence in yourselves and we need to help build that confidence. And you are all very important in your own way. We need to help girls to make decision making to help with decision making we need to provide them with the leadership space girls can also lead we need to mentor them we need to appreciate them and encourage them and help them to participate in youth programs we need to support the young girls who are struggling at school and to support early leavers to make a good transition and if they cannot go on to get some vocational skills and we need to and uh, really educate the uh, community that girls are very important. You asked me what job career opportunities were there for girls who study aquatic biology, yes. Um, most aquatic biology do aquatic ecology. You can do aquatic ecological restoration. Limnology is the study of fresh water. When you do fishery science or aquaculture, you can do f the fishery industry involving catching, processing, marketing, and conservation of fish. You can also learn about managing and understanding fisheries in, the academic, in academic education or study taxonomy. You can do aquatic biology and fisheries. You can do coastal aquaculture and marine aquaculture, fishery science and aquaculture, industrial fisheries. I talked about limnology, marine biology. Um, you can be an aquatic biologist or a fisheries biologist or an aquatic ecologist. You can be a fisheries or aquatic extension officer. You can be, as I said, uh, aquatic restoration officer, you can teach, you can lecture in the university, you can be a research scientist. I mean, I mean, all this. You know. So you can do, do, decide to work with the fisheries development boards, the water resources commissions, you can work in the university, you can work in the research institutes, you can work in food departments and standard boards, you can work at banks, you can do food processing and technology that is fish. So you can do agriculture. You can have a fish breeding farm. You asked me if there was a particular time when the challenges were so big, I wanted to give up. Yes, once I had a bad boss who made my life miserable, but I gritted my teeth and refused to I didn't let him calm me. It was not easy as there were not a lot of, lot, lot of women around me to give me support. But what I did was that I ignored him and I told myself that I will only be hurt if I allowed him to hurt me. So young girls, you can only be hurt if you allow people to hurt you. So if you do not allow people to hurt you, they cannot hurt you. You can decide that whatever bad things they are saying, you won't mind them. Whatever things they feel, you won't rise up. You won't fight any battles, you know. So, and I also had to face a lot of male chauvinism. As I said, a lot of men feel that what science and technology is a male dominated area. What are you doing here? And, and some of them will do all they can to get you out. You know? But over the years, when I became a leader, I found out that I don't have to fight all the battles. So I chose which battles to fight and which to walk away from. I have had to learn that sometimes the hard way. As a woman, there have been a few attitudes that have held me. You see, with women, we are a bit different from men because God has given us intuition. We are able to sense things. We are sensitive. We are able to collaborate with each other. We are passionate about what we do. And it's important that you have some independence. You don't always say that, please do this for me, do that for me. You have to be on top of your career. And you have to always know that being part of a team is worth it. I'd like to leave you with some motivational quotes, you know. Somebody said that, I'm not afraid of storms, for I'm learning to sail my ship. That is Louisa May Alcott. Michelle Obama said that there is no limit to what we, as women can accomplish. Lupita Nyong'o said that when, what I've learned from myself is that I don't have to be anybody else. Myself is good enough. And Coco Chanel said the most courageous act is still to think for yourself, aloud, think for yourself. If you don't see a clear path for what you want, sometimes you have to make it yourself. 
And that is from Mindy Carling. And Lady Gaga says, don't allow people to dim your shine because they are blinded. They'll tell them to put on some sunglasses. The future belongs to those who follow their dreams. And that is from Elena Roosevelt. I'm going to end here. I'm going to thank you. And I'm going to accept any questions that you bring my way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask any questions that you you have for me. All right, your, your presentation was great. I think it was very inspiring. <laughs> Is it something new? Thank you so much. Yeah. So, so um, if anyone has any questions, we can start with them. Um, girls, do you have any questions or someone? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, while we expect questions from our girls, I um, want to ask, um, uh, during the process of your, um, your school and work expert, well, how were you able to 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 um, figure this out? How were you able to pursue your dream? Because I, I believe um, you going as far as becoming a professor, there have been so many obstacles you have to and challenges that might come your way that you might have to like uh, overcome them before you get to this position. So can you please enlighten us more on how we can get there? Um, what I can say is that um, getting to the top is not a straight line. Sometimes you have to pause, you know. Um, let me start by saying uh, I had to do my physics twice before I went to university. And that really shook me because I used to top my class, you know. So um, you, you have to, once you get there, you have to set your priorities right. And uh, say that this is every, time, every January, take a sheet of paper. By the end of December, this is what I would have achieved. Um, if I have to pass all my subjects, my goal is to pass all my subjects. Whilst I was working, if I have to write papers, at least by December, I should write papers. Once you put it down, it's easier to tick, but you don't, it doesn't always happen because other things come your way. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, Ma. Yeah, um, I um, during our work, working on the um, the STEM girls school club, uh, one of the students were asking, you know, some of them have made up their minds of pursuing careers in STEM, but due to their parents um, um, not accepting or maybe wanting or the other, due to this um, gender. Um, stereotype that we are still facing is one of the things that has we held them from uh, like focusing and due to this they, they are having some challenges to face with their parents at home and so many other things so and um, as a result of as a result of this they're not able to concentrate and so many of them are saying uh, they will have to like give up on these dreams so i don't know what do you think um they can do at this point I, I think that um, it's important to also educate parents, not only the girls, because it, once the girls share the dreams, we normally tend to focus on the girls, but I think we also should also focus on the parents and communities. Uh, having, sure. role models, having role models is always a good thing. Encouraging girls, girls especially need mentors. So mm -hmm. uh, it's possible to assign a few mentors to the community and encourage them because it isn't easy. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes, I can. It's easy when they have to think through things on their own. And you know that in our, when you want to do STEM, the, the money and the rewards are not do not come overnight. So they will have to work very hard. But if they are role models, you show them some nurses, some doctors, some people who are in IT, um, in this computer age, you encourage the girls to study a uh, uh, computer, but you also involve the parents because I think that in some, most parts of Africa, it should be a community thing to encourage the girls. If we just concentrate on the girls alone, they go back to the community, they go back to their parents and there's no support. 
So we need to have some allies in the community, with teachers at school, uh, with, with PTA. I mean, it's an uphill task. But with girls, everybody thinks that they should stay at home, make money, or clean the house. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, yeah, go on. Yeah, I um, I also want to know what is the job market like being um in this field. Yes, I, I told you. I mean, the job market is quite actually it's quite good actually because there are very few fishery scientists, and aquatic biologists, and aquatic ecologists. You see, and they are needed at the fisheries department. They are needed at water resources commission. They are needed anywhere they do environmental impact assesses, assessment. They can teach. They can go into the university and be lecturers and rise up to be professors. Um, they can be ecological restorers. Now we are so busy spoiling our environment that we need to restore our environment. And anybody who is an aquatic biologist and aquatic ecologist is needed in that area. If you combine it with being very computer savvy and in this digitalization era, you can also be able to write programs and all that. Nowadays, people are combining biology and maths, biology and physics and all that. The sky is the limit. I think that the job market is very good. But because there are very few women, I mean, nobody hears about what is happening. Oh, that's good, man. Um, but also, where and where do you think um, uh, be, uh, these fields can actually take us to? If um, a girl is actually pushing careers in these fields, where where can it take you? Yes, yes. How far? Oh, I I can tell you that I just did one thing, you know. And it took me very far. I looked at the, the scientific basis behind all the traditional management of our water bodies, you know, lagoons, freshwaters, lakes, rivers. I just looked at the science behind it because, you know, there's this that you cannot farm where the river begins and um, at the headwaters of the river. It's a traditional thing that you cannot farm. It makes a lot of sense because if you farm at the headwaters of the river, the uh, 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 the, 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 the trees are cut down, the water isn't held, the groundwater dries up, you know. The, for fisheries, there are certain times that you shouldn't fish. And that is a way of protecting the fish and allowing them to grow. Um, you should not cut down the mangroves. I mean, I guess that for the rivers, the lakes, the lagoons, it took me to so many conferences and so many places because this is information I had generated myself. You understand and in, in in when i am a research scientist so in doing that i wrote a lot of papers because i can go from aquatic ecology to aquatic biology to fishery science and uh, to looking at community water and sanitation the most important thing is that if you're able to think critically it can take you anywhere being an aquatic biologist or an aquatic ecologist so now you you can write programs and all that the sky is the limit <laughs> all right thank you so much ma and um, um, during the uh, field work, your field work, can you yes. hear me, ma? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, how far I can are you traveling? You. How often do you do that? Now I'm retired. But at the time when I was collecting data, there were certain data that you have to go every month. There were certain data that you needed to collect every week. If you want to look at the quality of the water, you need to look at the quality of the water during the dry season, during the wet season. You know, you, uh, if you are looking at uh, microbiology, you, you, you go in a team with uh, people with other specifications. Sometimes you just have to go during the dry or wet season. But practically every month I was out there in the field collecting data. And, you know, when you are a fishery scientist, you also have to use the fish as an indicator of the quality of the water because there are certain fish that can stay in bad water and there are certain fish that disappear when the water is um, in bad. So even just studying fishes alone is a whole new world, world game because uh, with fish, just the position of their mouth will tell you where they eat, whether they eat at the surface of the water or they eat at the bottom of the water or they eat in the middle of the water. I mean, there's so much that you can learn and because we don't talk about it and we don't interact much with people who are in the field, young girls don't know. But I mean, field work is part and parcel of being a fishery scientist or an aquatic ecologist. Oh, that's really awesome. Please. It's awesome. Yes. Thank you I so much. 
I, I showed you the pictures. I was always going to the field, always, always. Sure, sure. It's right. Thank you so much, ma. Thank you so much. Um, do anyone else has a question? Or comment? Hi, am I audible? Yes. yes. Hi, that's, that's quite a lovely presentation that you've shared. And it's quite inspiring, really, to hear about all the potential that um, can be done and can be taken up. I'm particularly curious about the aspect of fisheries because myself, um, I'm a bit older, but if I were a young girl, I would have been so curious about what can I do in terms of fisheries in just my backyard or in my community at school. Are there sort of implementable projects for young girls uh, for them to just try themselves out, just put their foot out there and see how can I do something scientific here where I am right now. Okay. Um, if there's a river where you are or a lake or a pond, one of the first things you can do is to look at the quality of the, of, of the water, very simply. Secondly, if you want to do aquaculture, you have to find out the species of fish. I mean, Catfish and tilapia are some of the easiest fish to grow in your backyard. Backyard, but you have to look at the quality of the soil, whether um, it's clearly or sandy, or all these are very important. But uh, having a small fish farm is very doable, and even aerating it, you can use um, palm leaves to just beat the water to aerate. Aerate it. There are some very simple things that you can do. But if you want to go into fishery science in particular. You, 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 you will be learning a whole lot of other things apart from the fish. You have to know the different types of fish that there are. You have to know about the water quality of the water they stay in. You, you have to know about their, their behavior and all that. Um, I started studying fish when I was an undergrad uh, to the time I, I did my PhD. I, as I said, I'm retired now, but when I was a young um, girl, I, I just loved my work. I think aquatic biology and aquatic ecology and fishery science, there are things that you have to love, it. you have to be passionate about, otherwise you won't stay long in that field. I really enjoyed what I did when I was in active service. Thank you. Thank you for that, especially the tips on aerating the water. So palm leaves, I'll definitely keep an eye out on that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Is there any other question or comment? But then let me just Yes, ask. there is. Yes, please ask. Please ask. OK, I'll just please drop that on the, question, the, uh, on the on the chat box. Hello, Gabby. Can you see okay, my please. question? Can, I can't see yes. it, so can you read it out? Yes, the question is, do you think the future of aquaculture, nutrition, and feed industry is there is in the processes and both bioactives and additives from natural sources? Uh, I, the way I understand it, uh, they're asking if I think there's a future for aquaculture and fish nutrition and all that. I, I think there is because we are so busy. You know, there are two things. There's capture fisheries, fish in the wild that people go and capture and bring in. Uh, marine, there's marine fisheries and there's freshwater fisheries and there's aquaculture. I think right now we should be very serious about aquaculture because we are busy polluting our waters. For those who go for marine fisheries, the, the fish that are being brought are smaller and smaller and smaller. For rivers and lakes, we are busy polluting them with the illegal mining, domestic waste. Uh, nobody, we, we, we aren't caring for our water bodies as we should. So I think if we can concentrate and really um, improve on our aquaculture skills, that will also get that the um, diversity of fish that you can uh, um, grow with or breed with aquaculture is not as much as that that you catch in the wild. And not every fish can be bred in your backyard. 
And as I stated earlier, there are two fish that can easily be bred, and that is catfish and some species of tilapia. So yes, there's a future in it, if you ask me. Thank you so much, Professor. And there is another question in the chat box that says, assuming suitable sites and species selections have been made, what are the elements of farms? Very well. Can you repeat it, please? And can you speak slowly? Because I can't hear you very well. Yes, sorry, no problem. Uh, there is another question in the chat box, and it says, assuming suitable sea sites and species selections have been made, what sets the limit of farm fish production in a closed water body? Aha, uh -huh, I can see that. <laughs> okay, it says that, assuming suitable sites and species selections have been made, what says the limits of farm fish in a closed water body? Um, I think that um, the um, oxygen, the, the, the light penetration, um, the type of, um, um, the, if you set suitable site, suitable site, you also need to have suitable fingerlings. Fingerlings are small fish. And um, 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 the, the limits that you have is the kind of soil that you have uh, for the aquaculture, the availability of the water, where you're going to get your water from, the light penetration, the ox the quantity of oxygen that you have in there. I mean, these are some of the uh, 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 um, uh, limits for farmed um, fish production or closed water water. Because if you don't have it well aerated, you are going to have a lot of eutrophication and, and, and anoxia. I'm sorry, I'm becoming technical. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. Thank yeah, any other man. <laughs> okay, okay. Is there any? Oh, there is another question in the chat box. Uh, what portion of water is storing surface irrigation, it seems, can be used to domestic and other use possible? Hmm. Um, I, I cannot offhand, I don't know offhand the percentage, but if you are. Can you want to use the water for domestic in terms of washing and drinking and then irrigation? Um, I, I really don't know the portion that I'm going to do because I know that in rural areas they just use it as is, and in um, urban areas, um, surface irrigation schemes. And when may I ask the question the domestic and other purpose, what they are talking about? Are they talking about for drinking? Are they talking about, I mean, what is the domestic purpose that they want to use it for? Because normally when um, there's a portion of water that is used for irrigation in a, in a rural setting, it is used for everything. So I don't know, and that is not the way it should be used because if water is supposed to be used for irrigation, it should be used for irrigation. But it, it depends because if you extract too much for domestic and other purposes, the point of the irrigation will be mute. You're, you won't have a very good irrigation scheme. So your extraction for other purposes is also important. That's why I want to know what other purposes you are talking about. Is it for cooking? Is it for drinking? I'd like to know from the question. Yeah. Um, because if you are going to use water for irrigation, you have to be very careful of how much you want to extract. So um, I, I, I can't tell you offhand the percentage. I can't tell you that. But you need to be careful. So that's why I wanted to know, when you talk about domestic and other use, are you talking about for um, drinking, for cooking, for livestock, for that? I'd like to uh, have that from the questioner. Please, the person who asked the question, the person there. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, so um, please, what, what exactly were you talking about when you were thinking of domestic? Yeah, we are, we are talking about um, the aquatic habitants. Yes. Yeah. So um, we're saying um, what, like, what portion can be so useful for them, like that they can that the, the habitants can stay that won't be harmful to their health, like to prune them. 
so that you have a bottle, a, a bottle of water, you want to use some for irrigation. Yes, ma'am. You want to use some for um, domestic use, like cooking and washing. Yes. Oh, I can't tell you that. I, I, I don't know that. I don't know. All right, no problem. All right. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Uh, one last question. Or comment? Yeah. Lastly, I want to ask. Um, during this field of um, what what does it really take like studying um this aquatic biology? you yeah. actually did in school what how long does it take and what's the process like okay at university um i did chemistry um and biology for my first year first and second year and then when i got to the third year i dropped the chemistry and i did botany and zoology and then i did um zoology for my final year but for my masters i did aquatic biology i concentrated on um freshwater and lagoons and rivers and lakes. And then I went out to do something on aquatic resource management because it's very important to know. I mean, so I think that when you were talking about your irrigation schemes and all that, all I can say is that you have to be very careful about the water you extract to make the irrigation still um, viable. But that means that you have a constant source of water. So after doing that for my PhD, I did fishery science, but in between, you also do courses that would help you do environmental impact assessment. As I said earlier on, I mean, in Ghana, we are busy destroying our environment. So um, being able to restore the environment, ecological restoration is very, very important. And um, when you have a, a water body and you are in a place, you really have to, uh, with aquatic resource management, you have to make sure that um, you've apportioned the, so that I come back to your question. You, if you apportion the water very well, you don't need to pollute it because the same water body can be used for um, drinking and extraction for pipelines and through the taps. You need to be careful what you also use for our culture and all that. And all that comes into the planning in, in a community. So you'll be, uh, you'll be called upon to uh, uh, um, do an aquatic resource management plan. But I can't tell you the percentages now because I don't know your um, portion of water but in an aquatic resource management plan you have to make sure that there's enough water uh, to make sure that the uh, vegetation is okay that you have some for the people to use uh, that the, the fish are okay and that the water is not polluted you don't have point source pollution if there's a, a chemical plant or industrial plant nearby how much can they put in whether they treat their effluent and all that but um after you learned so much, but whilst I was doing that, I was also um, studying something on science policy. And but I did a lot of environmental impact assessment. I did a lot of fish taxonomy and fishery science, so um, I could um, document fish species in um, water bodies. I mean, you 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 can tell what kind of species a fish is by looking at the uh, fins and looking at the tail and the mouth and all that and the shape of the body. And, and, and that so um, there, you find that there are certain fish species that are peculiar to certain environments in West Africa. Uh, for in Ghana, there are six species that you could only find in Ghana. In Nigeria, there are certain species that you can only find in Nigeria. So um, when you are a fishery scientist, these are some of the things that you can do. It's quite broad, actually, but as you study, you can narrow down to the ones where you are passionate about. But when you are a research scientist, you have to write papers and you have to write papers. That's what that's why I said that um, looking at the scientific basis for traditional management took me to a lot of places because if you're able to generate the data that is original, that is even better. But you can also look at data that other people have generated and see whether you can link the dots and find something new. Thank Hello. You so yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now uh, we have a little bit of, of time for one last question. Is there anyone with one question or a comment? So would you like me to send my presentation to you? Yes, please. <laughs> they will be great. Okay.
Thank you so much. Okay, I think we don't have questions. So it is the beginning of the end of the talk show. Thank you so much, everybody, for all your inspiring contributions. And thank you for our guests for giving such interesting and inspiring talk show and also sharing with us her experience as a STEM woman. I am very happy to be here. And again, thank you so much, Professor. I think that you covered all the important points in every question you you like answered. So thank you so much. Thank and you, and I think that you are doing a wonderful job, and I wish you all the best. And I hope that more and more girls will be encouraged. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. Here is our social media, so you can stay connected. And if you have any question or you want to join the movement, you can just send us a message.